Uh, my name is Michael Edema. I'm presenting the Scozia PBX project. Uh, yes, I'm Michael Edema. I'm the developer of the of the project, and uh, it's being developed for IKT. I'm going to talk about what IKT is and how they sponsor us. Just a little bit of uh, plug there for them. What is a Scozia PBX? Why should you care? Because everybody kind of has a hatred against GUIs if you're an asterisk developer. Um, a GUI is your worst enemy most of the time. Uh, we're trying to develop that for exactly the opposite person, somebody who has no clue how asterisk works and just wants to uh, set up a PBX system in their house. So what and what else we have planned for the future? IKT is a research institute at a school uh, in Wolfenbüttel, Germany, and they do different cooperations with different, uh, different uh, companies researching uh, the next generation networks and uh, compatibility testing, protocol conformity tests, stuff like that. Uh, I never get down to that level, but everyone in the back does. So I don't have to read RFCs every day, I just have to read asterisk configuration files every day, which is about as fun. Um, kind of noticed that there are some good embedded distributions out there, but they're still very hard to use. They've managed to shrink down the asterisk install size and the operating system size so that it can work on appliance hardware, but there's still no way for the, for the beginner to get into uh, setting up an asterisk system. So that's kind of the first point there. The amazing flexibility of asterisk makes it incredibly complicated for the new user to get something basic set up. There's just way too many options. Um, should everybody be able to set up an asterisk system? It's kind of like knowing just enough to be dangerous. So maybe we shouldn't allow everybody to set up one. But I guess it's like five years ago or seven years ago, not everybody would imagine that they had a wireless access point and a router and switch and everything in their house. But now everybody does and it's completely normal. Mom and dad have a router and, and all this equipment, uh, which they don't understand at all, but they do use it. It's become a microwave for them. They just hit the button and they have internet. So are we going to get to that point? Are we going to get to the point where you need to have um, some device capable of speaking different, um, different telephony um, protocols and translating them back and forth in between the devices as we switch over from PSTN to and chopping off ISDN and replacing it with IP in the next two years, I guess, that's supposed to happen? Um, do we basically need a phone router? Nothing more than a phone router. So this was proposed uh, and IKT um, took it and put the money out there to sponsor the development on it. It started in the 1st of uh, January 2007 and after six months we had a beta that we released. It could do very little. but was stable and did work, so you could route SIP calls over this thing. Basically, it's going to be a hybrid PBX. That's what we're pr proposing to develop, but an easy-to-use hybrid PBX. It's perhaps an oxymoron. Uh, with logical defaults, just make it work, basically Google's philosophy. Common terminology, don't use um, jargon and acronyms and things that people are never going to understand. Make it simple. And don't put anything else in there that nobody's going to use. Just put in what people are going to use and don't touch it. And if it's working, just leave it alone because that's all they're going to use. If nobody complains that this feature isn't there, it's not going to be added. So until we notice that some strange phone from some strange country does not uh, work with it, we're not going to take the time to make sure we're, we're compatible with it. Again, just a phone router. Basically, it would sit in your house like this. I think everybody knows this. This is maybe um, not the right crowd to show a network diagram of how asterisk attaches to your network, but that's yeah, basically like that. So you have all your different internal connectivity and your external connectivity going through um, some intelligence. So what we have after 13 betas, 13 public betas, uh, we have an asterisk one for appliance distribution. It's more than a GUI. It's more integrated than a GUI. So it kind of takes a couple slides to explain why anybody should care. Uh, SIP, EX, ESDN, ESDN, ISDN, 
uh, analog uh, phones and provider accounts are all set up with a minimum amount of options to get them working. Conferencing transfers, voicemail via email, all the um, really standard stuff you expect to have working, and all the multilingual audio prompts in one, two, nine, ten, I don't know, ten languages or something. And all of this is in less than 15 megabytes. Um, the entire operating system kernel, all the binaries required for it is all less than 15 compressed as a binary installable image. Um, what else sets us apart a little bit, or hopefully sets us apart a little bit, is that the entire system is configurable via the GUI. There might be a GUI for asterisk, but we also have implemented all the GUI elements to configure the network interfaces, the wireless interfaces attached to the system, ESDN analog uh, interface cards, do all your firmware upgrades, um, get your mail client set up, all these little things that um, some GUIs will not take care of, and that's expected uh, that the normal user revert back down to the command line and start attacking the problem there, which will never happen. Um, NTP localization, all these things. And that entire configuration is not then stored as asterisk configs. It's abstracted out one layer, and it's stored as a single XML file. So you can back up, restore, provision a system with one single file. And you don't have to gather things in version, uh, version extensions.conf and version, all these different uh, internal pieces of your configuration. Um, what we're working on now is a simple package system so people can extend the system um, with more storage, with more prompts, with custom applications, things like that. It's nowhere near what Druid is doing. Uh, that's a little beyond our current capability. Question: How do you how do you actually refrain from the uh, sorry, from the uh, from the urge to add a little more a little more and kind of go beyond what you guys thought of when you started because you know so many cool features and there's so much urge you know what maybe I'll add this a little yeah. feature the the how question is how you're not gonna grow out of the, the question is how to resist expanding the system as people request things, and I guess who makes those decisions. Uh, ultimately, I do, um, but then the, the community can veto me, I guess. If everybody says they want it, then I'd be an idiot to say, no, that's stupid. No, One exception, though. <laughs> what? He tosses to be less. You kind of your guiding philosophy yeah. to be less. Only exactly what you need to do routing, telephone routing and some basic applications, like a glorified answering machine. It was on the slide, I didn't say it. But there's, there's one exception to this too that is constantly mentioned in the community is SSH support. But the problem is the users don't understand that SSH support won't get you anything in an embedded system that automatically generates and overwrites its own files. But to communicate that point uh, to a group of people who may understand it or may not understand that is uh, a constant fight. But yes, uh, as little as possible. If there's a good use for something, um, for example, the provisioning things uh, we talked about uh, yesterday, that's another thing we want to do, but you have to make sure that the packages involved in it can only take up a couple hundred kilobytes. You can't put in a Perl interpreter and then a library and this and that and that and have doubled the entire size of the distribution because somebody wanted to provision a SNOME telephone. That's it makes no sense. So there has to be another way to round it. Um, this is a little bit of the GUI. That's, everybody likes pictures. So that's what it looks like. This is setting up a SIP account. Uh, the bolded fields are required. So to set up a functioning SIP account in the system, you only need an extension and a caller ID. Uh, everything else is set up by default. And you can hit save and have a dialable extension by filling in two fields. So that's the big stepping point. It's even been thought to take away the audio codecs and video codecs sections of this because it's kind of intimidating. It's very technical. There's abbreviations and words that people don't know. But by default, you can fill in two fields and have a dialable extension. Same way with voicemail. You fill in a host name of your, v of your uh, email server, email address. If you don't have a password, you don't need it, but most everybody has a password. Put in password, hit save and you automatically have voicemail to email for all the extensions that have an email address defined. The same thing goes for ISDN interfaces. They show up, they're automatically detected. Um, 